Hey, what's up? This is your girl, Vita Guerra, and thank you for tuning in to Heaven with Vita. I have my good friend, Claire Kia. You want to say hi? Hi, everybody. <laughs> and so we have a special guest calling all the way from London, um, author of a book. Um, do you want to chime in? And <laughs> Hello? Uh, do you want me to chime in now? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I know, I was like selling it and this is how it's going. Yeah, no one. Um, yeah, um, so my name is uh, Habiba Kande. I'm from London, England, originally from Nigeria. And I'm the author of the book Kunyaza, The Secret to Female Pleasure. And I just want to say thank you to Vida for inviting me on your show. Yes, we're so happy to have you. So today we're going to talk about the book and uh, female pleasure. I'm sure a lot of women out there are tuning in, and men as well. I feel like men need to be changing also. <laughs> so tell us a little bit um, how you got started with the book. I mean, you've been an author for a long time. Maybe give a little background before we dive into the book. Sure, sure. So um, by profession, I'm an accountant, which is not the most interesting job in the world. Um, but my side hustle is like I write books, so I've written six books in total, uh, mainly non-fiction, um, on the subjects of race, history and erotology, which is basically the study of sexual desire and art of lovemaking. And um, I've written three books on erotology, one from an African Arab perspective, um, another book written about erotology from um, an Islamic perspective, and then my latest book, which is Kunyata, which is looking at erotology, like the science of um, ancient sexual practices, but mainly looking at from a Eastern Central African perspective. So, yeah, so okay. my interests are quite wide, but it's um, my main interests are race, history and um, erotology and looking at like understanding female sexual pleasure and traditional sexual practices. Yeah, this is actually what is needed now in today's world, because Especially, I don't know how it's over there in, in London, but, uh, you know, over here people are just, just having sex and people are not being fulfilled and it's not coming from a sole purpose. And, um, you know, people are just like, kind of like emotionalists, right? And it's just like going through the motions and they're not really getting anything out of it. So um, we talk about it here on the show. Um you know, how to reach the orgasm, but not the orgasm that everyone has reached, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. I think um, I agree with what you're saying, because especially when we look at the issue of sex and sexuality, especially from looking at sexual female sexual pleasure, there's a lot of misinformation, um, misconceptions, and a lot of myths surrounding um, sexu sexuality and sexual pleasure, especially looking at it from the female perspective side. And I think um, again, I'm all people are free to do whatever they like and things like that. But I don't think, although many people are having sex, I wouldn't see say that a lot of people are having fulfilling sexual lives. And um, I exactly. think there is a lot that we can learn from the ancients, from the people from the past. Um, a lot of those traditional texts, whether it's from ancient India, ancient Ch China, from the ancient Arab world, even in um, parts of Africa, there are a lot of things that I think even people in the modern day world can learn. And that's why I think. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to come across a number of um, sacred texts and sacred t traditions, and I think I'm trying to revive it, and hopefully there's something which the modern people can learn from the people, the wise people of the past, because I think they had many uh, many answers that we're kind of seeking today in terms of, like, not only in terms of, like, in terms of how to have an orgasm, but in terms of how to have a fulfilling um, love life with your partner kind of thing. So I think there's a lot we can learn from the people from the past. Mm -hmm. And so, like, let's speak about that like how people that are listening how mm -hmm. can they have a fulfilling um uh love making life with their partner you know I based think, on like the old way of how they were doing things and creating something new i think ultimately what it comes down to um as much as everyone seems to a lot of people seem to be obsessed with connection i mean um techniques and orgasm and ejaculation if people are thinking about the end result Whereas a lot of the people from the past, before you're thinking about the end result, you need to have a connection with your with your with your partner. It's all about having a connection first and foremost, whether that's in the form of um, obviously committed relationship, marriage, what have you. But I think first and foremost, that's one of the most important things that you've got a connection with your partner. You're compatible as well because you could be two individuals who 
you know, could be nice and you can get, be attracted to one to one another, but you might not be sexually com- compatible and also emotionally compatible. Because because I think one thing which the people of the past, which I think they were much better than us, is that they were more patient in terms of trying to understand each other's bodies and understand what works for each partner, both from the male perspective and the female perspective. And rather than being um, quite inv- in individualistic and selfish and thinking about your own um, pleasure, it's all about, okay, for the people in the past, it was all about trying to understand their partner's pleasure and trying to make sure that they have a fulfilling experience as well as they do kind of thing. So rather than thinking about my my main purpose from this sexual session, for example, is for in order for me to have an orgasm, it's no, how can we both mutually enjoy, um, enjoy this exchange kind of thing. So I think they were very focus about um mutual pleasure and the ultimate goal with many of their practices whether you're looking at the Taoist tradition whether you're looking at the tantric sex um tantric sex tradition whether you're looking at the kunyasa tradition it was the ultimate goal was um pleasure as opposed to the orgasm or the ejaculation in, in and of itself where i think whereas i think when we look at today's society we just seems to be obsessed with like like I said, like the end goal, whether it's ejaculation, or orgasm, what have you, whereas they wasn't as concerned about these type of things. I mean, if it came, it came. Like if ejaculation came, if orgasm came, that's fine. But ultimately, I think it's all about trying to create a fulfilling um, sexual experience where both parties can enjoy each other's company kind of thing. And I think one of the one of the ways which, again, many of the traditional sources mentioned was about having like this mutual um this ex- this connection between two partners, whether it's in the form of like I said, a sexual exchange, whether it's in the terms of forming um having a, a long committed relationship, but it's about being compatible with one another. And again, that can generally that generally only happens with time and exploring each other's bodies and understanding what each other's partner's needs are. Yeah. Can I? I have a question. Uh, this is Claire here. I wanted to know specifically. Mm-hmm. in regards to the female aspect of it like how did that come about for you what made that such a curiosity in wanting to explore that topic okay i'm gonna be quite i'm gonna be honest um i've got, i've got an ego not as much of a, a big a big as ego as i had um when i was in my, my teens i'm in my mid-30s now but I was always someone that, and I'm not saying it's a good thing, but this is a trait that a lot of men do have, is that you want to pleasure a woman and you get some satisfaction from that. And again, I'm not saying it's, nece- it's not necessarily a good thing because someone could argue that am I ple- trying to pleasure a woman for her sake or my own sake kind of thing. But that was the kind of the environment I was brought up in. And it was something which, again, having discussions amongst some of my male friends, again, I'm not to, not to say that every woman that I had relations with, I was able to satisfy them completely because that was definitely not the case. But I was someone that was always wanting to learn from the female perspective because I know in terms of for the man, it's very easy for me to to experience gratification. Whereas I know that for women, with women, it's, it's, not that, it's not that easy kind of thing. And again, having relations and not really physical relations but speaking intimately with a number of like female friends I knew that this was an issue that many women weren't pleasured and um, I was fortunate enough to have um, a number of open-minded older relatives female relatives who would speak about this issue like in terms of the inability of a lot of women to um, to experience climax why a lot of women fake it and she I mean I had a number of like I said older women relatives who were schooling me about sex and sexuality and how as a man you're, you, it's your job to pleasure a woman now again I'm not going to lie initially I was coming from that from a selfish egotistical standpoint because I thought okay that will make me feel more of a quote-unquote man but then as I matured and you know in my mid to late 20s then I was actually interested in um, a number of I was interested in learning about Asian sexual traditions which taught about these subjects because one of my frustrations is that in the western world it's taught as if the sexual revolution of the 1960s discovered female pleasure. They discovered the female ejaculation. And even the G-spot, which everyone knows about the G-spot, that was quote-unquote discovered in the 1950s. So for me, it was like, are we trying to say that before Dr. Grafenberg found this this area in the woman's genitalia, which surprisingly a lot of women's part of their genitalia is named after a white German man, which is problematic, but I'm not going to go into that. Before that, is that as if we didn't know about the female anatomy. And like I said, there were many traditions in ancient India, ancient China, in parts of Africa and parts of the Arab world, 
where they spoke at length about the importance of pleasuring a woman. And being a Muslim and from the Muslim tradition, there is a, a rich um, tradition going back 600, 700 years where men are told that it's part of manhood, it's a part of your obligation to satisfy your your female, your, your wife. So again, in terms of from a cultural perspective, from a religious perspective, the onus was always on the man to ensure that his wife um, is, is, um, is pleasured in the bedroom. So for me, it was normal. But then just having discussions and speaking to a number of people, and, and again, just from what I'm seeing in, in the media, where pe- like you've got a lot of articles where people are talking as if they've just discovered that women can have an orgasm or women are multi-orgasmic and women um, you know, can have all of these great experiences when this was something that was mentioned and, and written about hundreds of years ago. And especially, obviously, being of African descent, one of my frustrations was that the work and the contribution of particularly of um, African women who spoke about the importance of um, sexual pleasure in relations, many people wouldn't speak about it because they wasn't aware of it. So we're aware of the contributions which the Asian Indians made, the Asian Chinese made. Obviously, we know about the Kama Sutra and things like that. But if I were to ask people what about the African people's contribution towards sexuality, not many people are aware of it. So I wanted to, I think it's important that, again, um, because a lot of traditional African countries were oral traditions, not many of their practices were documented. So again, not many people are aware of it. So that's why I thought, especially when I came across the Kunyaza tradition, I thought, okay, it's important that, you know, this is documented and preserved before another people kind of, you know, write about it and then they make it like they kind of discovered it, which again, I just had some issues with that. So for me, it's about trying to preserve ancient traditions, which I think are beneficial and hopefully people can benefit from it. And ultimately, eradicate the stigma um, surrounding female ejaculation because as, as I'm sure you both know like there's a lot of myths or misconceptions around female ejaculation yeah. many people think it's um it's urine and things like that whereas a lot yeah. of women who's experienced it they know it's not because it's their lived reality where but for a woman who's never experienced um ejaculation I can understand why she might feel that you know it doesn't exist or is urine and because of what she's the misinformation that she's been taught from maybe a young age and what she's been conditioned to believe when a lot of women are at the point where they feel that they might be able they might be able to ejaculate because they they've been taught told that it's urine they hold back and they're not able to actually enjoy um this you know this this uh discussion experience kind of thing so i think it's about educating people and again it's not about educating only children i think adults need as much education as as, uh, as children kind of thing so um there are a number of reasons but ultimately it's trying to raise awareness about um kunyaza to um highlight the contributions that africans particularly african women have made towards um female sexuality and sexual pleasure because i don't think they get the credit they deserve and ultimately, again, to help maybe people have more better fulfilling like love lives. Hopefully, that's in a nutshell. What? Yeah, so that, yeah, that's needed. And I don't know how it is in the UK, but like over here, um, like pornography is 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 huge. Right. And you know, people and kids and you know, young adults are looking at this and their expectations or what they think sex is because basically everyone's just following what they see, right, and what they make popular they think that that's the right way but that's not always the way it's the um you know it's the same thing when i've i've talked to friends of mine and i'm like you know i know that in and we hear it in songs and hip-hop and pop culture mm-hmm. and like beat the pussy up and yeah it's like yeah no it's not made for you to beat it up you know? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't know who told you that mm-hmm. but <laughs> like, yeah it's, it's not a punching bag like <laughs> yeah don't do that and then play with music that is at a 440 frequency, which is in disharmony yeah. with us. And then that programming beat it up. Exactly. Then this is this is the result that women are not being yeah. satisfied. They're not. And then to, you know, one of the things that I've always said has been when in this Western world, I can't speak to others because I don't live there. But in this Western world, when men are born, it's literally they're born into an atmosphere that says this is your penis this is what you do with it it's yours you can share it you can hold on to it you can play with it you can do whatever you want when a female is born into this western world she is told don't let anybody touch you you're gonna call you a hoe Mm -hmm. they're gonna think that you're not this and you can't do anything until you get married Mm -hmm. like so 
do we not understand that we're creating an imbalance from day one? Yeah. I mean, that happened to me. Like, my parents, my mom was uh, 16 when she married my dad in Cuba. And, you know, she was a virgin when she got married. So my parents' expectations of me were the same thing. And when I had my first boyfriend and I finally did have sex, then I had a block with it because I felt like I was doing something bad and wrong. And then I wasn't getting pleasure because I have a blockage. Exactly. Yeah. You put the shame on top of that. It creates a block. And then it's a disassociation between yourself because your body feels one thing. Just as teenagers, that's what you go through. You have these emotions that are coursing through your veins and you feel it on a physical level. Mm -hmm. But then on a mental level, your mind as a woman is being told this is wrong. So why does this feel so good? So you are out of alignment between what your body is telling you feels amazing and what your mind and the story that has been given to you is being told you should not do that. Mm -hmm. So then we wonder why there's so much trauma and abuse or why and not to say that this is the specific reason, and I want to be very clear, but why women are being taken advantage of in mm-hmm. a sexual way. It's because there's so much repression yeah. seeped in there that it has nowhere to go. It has to have an outlet. Mm-hmm. And it's also why a lot of, you know, even going into that conversation is another conversation with victims of sexual assault, not realizing how your body as a woman reacts your vagina will lubricate itself to protect itself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of women will have climax in a rape situation and not understand it. How does this happen when my, when I know I don't want this? Mm -hmm. Well, your body has created a defense mechanism to automatically lubricate itself so that you don't get hurt on a physical level because mentally you're already being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. But when we don't talk about the female body and how it responds and how it reacts naturally, just on a natural basis, we create all of these stigmas attached to it, and then there's no freedom in your expression. Mm-hmm. So I um, I applaud you for approaching this. This is something that even as someone, and I consider myself, you know, kind of a, a sexuality savant, uh, kunyaza is not something I'm familiar with. I know, I want to know more. Yeah, Yeah, so please tell us more because now I'm like... Yeah, it was like, (laughs) please tell us a little bit about what you put into the book because Kunyaza is, you know, new to me. So I want to hear from you as the author, like, what are some of the principles and concepts? Okay, so the the, the technique itself, Kunyaza, is um, derived from a word in in one of the Rwanda languages called Kunyara, which basically means to urinate or to ejaculate. Um, The technique itself um, is a heterosexual technique in which a man uses his his penis head to stimulate the woman's clitoris and um, labia minora and labia majora in order to facilitate female ejaculation and um, hopefully orgasm during the sexual encounter. Now, the way he stimulates the woman's um, genitalia is through a, a number of methods. I mean, whether it's like uh, horizontally, um, s- circular movements or zigzag movements. Now, the actual technique itself is not that special, but it's about it's about what it's trying to achieve, which is ultimately to enhance female pleasure, which hopefully could lead to um, whether ejaculation or orgasm. Now, when because a number of people ask me, okay, what's so special about this technique? The technique itself, like I said, it's not that it's not that it's distinctive from any type of masturbation, which mutual masturbation, which a man might um, perform on on, the, on his female partner, but what is what the the importance of it is that because the man is involved with the woman, and obviously he's using his genitalia, it's teaching it's teaching men to be patient. It's, it's also teaching men to prioritize his partner's pleasure over his own. It's also teaching him to try and explore her her body with him so again it's a it's a technique which is about mutual pleasure it's not just about the male pleasure and then touching on the point which Vida mentioned earlier about pornography and this is something again which I think has affected a number of both men and women but men in particular when a lot of men think about sexual pleasure or or sexual acts nine times out of ten we're we're thinking about the actual um, act of penetration itself the jackhammer approach and for men, because that 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 gives us the most pleasure, we think ultimately that's what's going to give the woman 
the most pleasure because obviously the performative scenes that they see in um, pornography, which again is is not real, but again that feeds our understand our misunderstanding of of what sex is about. But coming back to kinyasa, because it's a practice again, like I said, which is um it's a non penetrative um technique which it focuses primarily on the clitoris and stimulating the clitoris. It's a technique which is ultimately it's all about trying to seek um seek enhanced pleasure for the woman kind of thing so it's very female orientated and again one of the things which in, i found really intriguing in terms of rwandan culture rwanda is a country um it's a very small country of 13 million people located in east central africa and one thing i found which i touched on in the book not only the technique itself but it's the culture of the of the west Af of the east african people because many of the hang-ups which also which you mentioned earlier about which maybe some women do have it and maybe that's what prevents them from enjoying the sexual relations and ultimately achieving pleasure is because again like I said some mental ha hang-ups and mental blocks that they've got whereas for my research and speaking to a number of female sex educators known as Sengas in Rwanda a lot of the body issues that maybe some women have a lot of the issues like in terms of women having agency of their own body women's right to sexual ple pleasure it didn't really exist because they were taught from a young age that women are sexual beings just as much as men and if anything, women have a right to pleasure. Or, and, and, and again, whether this is linked to male ego or not, in their culture, men wasn't seen as real men unless they're able to satisfy their wife. And again, it's very different from what we understand about, you know, male-female dynamics in terms of sexual pleasure in the Western world, where it's generally, it's all about male pleasure. It's all about the jackhammer approach from pornography and things like that, whereas in Rwanda, which is, I would say the technique is similar and it's been described as like the African ta Tantra, where, as we know with Tantra, ultimately it's all about slow sex. It's, a, it's, it's about intercourse, but again, it's about slow, in, slow penetrative thrust because ultimately that's what hopefully we could give both partners um, enhanced pleasure. And similarly with Kunyaza, it's um, the actual technique, again, it's supposed to be rhythmic, like how a person will play with the drums, but it's not like you have to do it. Um, uh, a certain way it's all about just exploring the woman's genitalia obviously with the man in order to enhance her pleasure but for me like I said one of the uh, aside from the technique itself it was about the culture of Rwanda and Uganda as well where it's also practiced because they their mindset was very different compared to maybe how we see um, sexual relations in the west and another thing that which um, I wanted to touch on which I mentioned in the book in addition to the Kinyasa practice, there's also a practice called um, Gokuna, which is labia elongation, which they practice in parts of Rwanda, Uganda and Kenya. And um, women from a, a young age are encouraged to elongate their, their labia, basically by stretching their labia minora. And the purpose of this is, is in order to, um, a, to, a, to increase skin-to-skin -skin contacts during penetrative sex, which hopefully would enhance the pleasure for the man and the woman. Now, this practice of labor, yeah. now this, this practice of labor elongation, and, and the reason why I find it remarkable, because when we look at the Western world, and again, this is because of pornography, a lot of women are, a lot, exactly, the, lab, the labiaplasty surgery, which is very popular in America, the UK and Australia. It's one of the most um, commonly sought after cosmetic surgeries um in the western world so and again this idea that you know a lot of women want to have like a what is called a, a, a barbie doll vagina um with a um with the the lips that's in touch yeah but that's that, that's what it's called the cosmetic surgery is called a barbie um doll vagina a barbie vagina and again a lot of that is linked to pornography because a lot of women's um view of what a quote-unquote perfect vagina or vulva genitalia looks like is from what they're seeing in pornography and that's a that's a that's a problem. Whereas again, in in parts of East East and Central Africa, a lot of women were proud to have like elongated labias, and there wasn't as much of a shame attached to their genitalia as as there seems to be in in much of the Western world. So again, in terms of like a lot of body confidence issues, which I know unfortunately many women um, suffer from in parts of the Western world because of porn and the media and, and even some male partners, unfortunately there didn't seem to be that much of an issue uh, in parts of Eastern and Central Africa because, again, like, that was something that I was shocked by because, again, it wasn't, like I said, just the, the technique itself. It was the sexual culture or the sexual history of the the Rwandan people. Unfortunately, I mean, the Kanyaza practice has been um, exercised for 
hundreds of years since like the 16th century. But after the Europeans, um, primarily the Belgians and, and uh, Germans, colonized um, Rwanda, they taught they told the Africans at the time the the Rwandans that this type of practice is barbaric and they should stop, they should stop doing it. So again, this is another one of my issues that like a lot of the traditional practices, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in um, the Arab world, whether it's in Asia, many a times it was the Europeans that came in and said like, you should stop doing these barbaric practices. And then hundred years later, they're like, like, oh, we've discovered um, you can pleasure a woman by doing ABC. Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. So for me, it was just like, okay, we need to sidestep what we've been taught because a lot of what, what we've been taught by the, our colonizers was inaccurate and we should kind of go back to our, um, that which is beneficial, that is. Again, I'm not saying we have to incorporate all of it, but that which is beneficial, we should um, take from our like ancestors who kind of left a legacy which was rich and fulfilling and I had a lot of the answers which many people, like I said, now are kind of searching for. Yeah. I think it's also something that you said prior that is very important and I think a lot of people miss through it because we've been taught that the body needs to be covered up all the time. Yeah, we allow babies, you know, when they're about up until six months old, we let them run free naked and That's they're happy cute. and it's cute. And then we get to a certain, they get to a certain age and we're like, no, you know, boys have to cover up, girls have to cover up. And what you do when you do that, when you're not around human bodies to see them on a regular basis, it does become where you turn to media to get the understanding of the human body. Instead of it becoming the aspect or the, the understanding that let kids play together, let them see each other. Because when we continue, if we cover up human bodies and make it where it's only this, we don't, we become desensitized to then when we do declothe or derobe, then it does become, oh, wait, I'm comparing you to that movie I saw. Mm-hmm. And that girl was naked and I really liked her, but you don't look like her. So something's wrong with you. And it's like, no, it's just another variation of a human body. But because we don't see the human body out in the open, we are making comparisons to unrealistic ideals in visuals that don't, that are not effective. And so it does become a thing where then personally you get shamed because you don't get the reaction from a partner that you thought you were going to get when you take off your clothes. Because they're comparing you to a movie they saw. Mm-hmm. And you don't even know that they'd have never seen another human, another woman in their life. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's, it, it's, it seems like, you know, this is what makes you wonder, you know, I mean, because we know how powerful sex is. And especially doing it with two people that, that are really in love, how you can manifest and create. Yes. You know, I mean. You create a human being, for God's sake, you know, so there's a lot of power in that. Create worlds like that. So withholding it from from the world, right, and making it seem like it's something bad or it, it just creates something for people to be. It's the greatest genius of ever. Yeah. It's, if you want to keep, if you want to keep a, a humanity in, in darkness, you prevent them from sexual liberation. It mm-hmm. is the great, like, honestly, I see the genius in it, to be quite, like, I can't help but laugh mm-hmm. and to think of the amazingness and the profundity that has been created around colonizing continents, countries, and regions, mm-hmm. because it is the most amazing thing. And on the other hand, we can talk about colonizers all we want to, but at some point in time, all people of color bought into it. So yeah. we are just as much to blame. I agree. I, I I wanted to um get your thoughts on something which um yeah I want to get your thoughts on something um the idea that or what do you think about the idea that in order to be like sexually liberated you need to have um like many or as many sexual partners as you want because that's something that I'm hearing a lot and I I've got some pushback with that because I mean for me and this is something which I found from some of my studies was that you can be sexually liberated and be celibate or be in one relationship. Do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. But I just think there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure on both men and women alike. It's not just, it's not just women, but that this idea that, you know, you know, you need to be sexually liberated, which is all well and good, but it's like the, the idea, the notion of being sexually liberated is having multiple sexual partners when for me, you can be sexually liberated and 
you know, it's it all comes down to choice. Yeah. So, and that's something which I've noticed that's now coming on, coming out a lot that this idea that because I'm sexually liberated, that I have multiple partners when my understanding is that you can be sexually liberated, but it's who you want to have sex. If you don't want to have sex with anyone, if you want to be monogamous, if you want to be polygamous, that's up to you. But this yeah. idea that you need to have multiple partners to be sexually liberated, yeah. I think that's something which that's what is dangerous. To feed right now yeah. to the young one. It's another way to repress. Yeah. It's another yeah. way to repress. <laughs> And it, you know, because we talk about it all the time on the show about energy and like every time you're you're letting someone in, you're you're mixing that person's energy into your energy, and it's actually creating. It, it's like okay, yeah, you could be liberated. It's go ahead, but it's really actually working against you. It is mm-hmm. because you're still here. Here's the thing about it, and I I've, I've spoken about this um, countless times on my Instagram live when people have asked me these questions and they ask because I'm celibate right now. Okay. Mm. That's good. So, and I have had the most sexual liberation in my past year of celibacy than I ever have in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm a very, I consider myself to be a very sexually liberated woman, but I will say this: if you are in any way, shape or form carrying shame with you in your sexual chakras, you are exchanging that energy with also people who have sexual repressed energy in their chakras. So you are not liberating yourself in the way of authenticity. Mm -hmm. You're liberating yourself just exchanging negative energy with people. Mm -hmm. So that's not liberation. That's actually more suppression. But you think that you're liberated because you're saying to the world, I don't uh, adhere to your ideology, so therefore I must be liberated. It's all an act. It's all a ploy. It has to start with your own self-awareness, as with anything in life, is what is going to gravitate toward you and magnetize toward you is who you are. So you can have somebody who is disassociated with themselves, thinking that they're liberated, sleeping with five and six people, uh, going around uh, spreading that, or you can have a person who is self-aware and finds two amazing partners to take them to climax and that's their version of liberation or in the case with myself being very clear on what i desire Mm -hmm. and finding the most pleasure within my own self-love session Mm -hmm. and i have the most amazing climaxes by myself than i know half the women do in la Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) so i think that that is a myth and i think that it it goes into understanding yourself if you don't have self-awareness you will be just as jacked up with one person mm-hmm. as you can be with 10 yeah i agree with that no, and you will be worse with 10 <laughs> so, i agree with that 100 percent. i agree with that you know um when i was i did a one year of celibacy and that's when i was the most liberated that i've ever been in my whole life because i made the vow to myself and i stay within that and i didn't let anything and then after that it's it's, it's kind of like it's so easy yeah well i say that as well i think that everyone should go through a bout of celibacy meaning don't exchange fluid with another person but learning yourself mm-hmm. because when you become very immersed in yourself and you learn what really pleases you it's very easy to discern when you meet someone whether they can or cannot because you've taken the time out with yourself to learn yourself emotionally, physically, as well as spiritually. And when you take that time, you begin to recognize really early who's for you and who's not just by the energy they carry. Mm -hmm. You no longer have to spend time or waste time to see, is this gonna go somewhere, is it not? Because you're listening and you're tuned in to a different level. It's not just about getting off anymore. Now it does become about in the Kunyaza way of that being able to connect and being able to see if this person really can even turn you on just by talking to you. Mm. Yeah, that's deep. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that, that is, if any young girls are, are listening, like, definitely listen to this because it's so important. And I know that society is telling you, oh, just be free and just have sex. And no, that's not the way, but baby girl, that's just digging a deeper hole. <laughs> it's just masking it even more so. Yeah. It's, a, it's another way that the media can spend something to take you out of your power. Mm. True power is being able to walk into a room knowing that everyone wants it and there's no price that anybody can pay to get it. Mm-hmm. That's power. Yeah. That's, 
Yeah, I like if that. <laughs> if you have a price that you can attach on to it, how mm-hmm. powerful is it? Exactly. You can be bargained for. Mm-hmm. If you can be bargained for, that's not value. Mm-hmm. You can't walk into a Lamborghini dealership and bargain for that shit. Mm-hmm. Come on, but you can bargain for a Honda. Mm-hmm. You can bargain for a Cadillac. Mm-hmm. But the high-end cars, you can't bargain for those. The price is the price. Yeah. You either got it or you don't. No, I agree. I agree with that. So, that's yeah, powerful stuff. That's powerful stuff. Power. I think from the from a male perspective, one of the things which I'm again, I'm not going to say I'm fully where I should be because I'm still a work in progress. But um, <laughs> it's like we've from again coming coming from the western coming from the western world. I I do agree with what you're saying, but it's like we're taught that you. Which is kind of crazy. We we celebrate strength and being powerful in all aspects, but when it comes to sexual restraint, we praise men who are weak, who are sexually weak, who can't control their desires. So, like, if there's a, an attractive woman that a man is maybe talking to, you know, maybe platonic friends, or what have you, he's expected, especially if she's interested, to sleep with her because, you know, he's supposed to give in to his desires. Whereas in all aspects of life we praise someone for being strong and to be able to, you know, with in all aspects. But again, like I said, when it comes to sexual desires as being sex, to sexually restrain yourself, for some reason, I don't know why, but men in particular, again, I'm not speaking about all men, but generally, like, we're encouraged to kind of, like, if there's an attractive woman, you definitely should sleep with her. How, how could you not sleep with her? And I think that's another form of, like, miseducation or some, some part of our culture which we kind of need to change because, like you both said, it is kind of destructive to your soul or whether you believe in chakras and things like that. But I think conversations amongst men, because a lot of men, and unfortunately, a lot of men will say the right things, what they need to say in public, but behind closed doors. And again, especially when we're in safe spaces amongst men, we kind of encourage each other, pat ourselves in the back to give in all the time to sex, to our sexual desires. When, even though we know that it might not be for our own best interest long-term kind of thing. So I think that's something which again needs to change, but again, it, it does take a while. I read something um, today that was very interesting to me, and it said, you know, there are so many men who are heterosexual who believe that because they have sex with women, that's what makes them heterosexual. But if they really sit and think of who they bond with, who they talk with, who they spend time with, who they actually ask for advice for, who they look up to, who they hold space for when they're angry or what have you, it's men. So is that really, are you really heterosexual because you sleep with women? When in all honesty, most of your conversations that are intimate are had with other men. That's deep. Mm. (laughs) Mm. I thought so too. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Or the men that degrade the women and treat the women bad, like, you know, in the pornos that you slap the women, you know, like do all these things that are degrading women under 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 that yeah is it something else exactly so it's like you claim yourself to be heterosexual because you have sex with women but mm. who really holds space for you intimately are your boys mm-hmm. so what you really saying you know what i mean and it, 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 it is something to think about because i think it is imperative like with my you know my male friends I know what good men look like because of them. Mm. And I feel like they understand what a good woman likes, looks like because of me. And those friendships are important. Those, mm. those platonic friendships, because not everyone who is attractive to you do you need to be romantic with. I agree, 100%. There are connections beyond that. Mm-hmm. But here, you know, like they, if you're, if they're a person of, if you're attracted to the person, then it's like if it's a man and a woman, then all of a sudden, yeah, it, it's like, oh, you're sleeping with her, you're sleeping, no, yeah, actually, we're just really good friends, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, like we respect each other, we love each other, we spend time together, we've never even, you know, done anything past a hug. Like, uh-huh. how is that such a foreign concept for you to get? It? Yeah, you know, and I've I've coined them my male friends, they are my warriors. I say every goddess needs her warriors, mm-hmm. and every man needs his priestesses mm. to speak life into him yeah. to breathe into him to give counsel to him we all need those people yeah now that I I, 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 yeah. no, I I agree I agree with that and that's something that, again I'll be brutally honest with you because that's something which 
again, because of the nature of the work that I do and things like that, when I'm having discussions with my male friends, obviously in private, the first, one of the first questions is, oh, you must, are you trying to sleep with this woman? Are you trying to sleep with that woman? I'm like, no, I'm speaking about my book. I'm promoting my book or this, that, and the other. And the mindset, again, unfortunately for a lot of men, is that you can't have a platonic relationship with a woman that is attractive without you trying to have an ulterior, ulterior motive. And like what you said, I do agree that it's important, both for men and women, that you've got um, friendships with people of opposite, opposite sex. It definitely helps me anyway because I get a different perspective. But again, for a lot of men, we're kind of just taught that you can't have a female friend because we're so weak. And again, that's we've bought into that when I don't agree. Like this idea that if there's an attractive woman, you can't resist her. You're going to have to try and make a pass at her, which I, I think if you've got a bit of self-respect for yourself, you, c you can control those desires and you won't even have those desires because you look at her a different way kind of thing. But for whatever reason, a lot of men were kind of taught that, you know, you have to give in to those desires because that's what you're supposed to do as a man which is which is crazy it is and there is the the aspect of self-respect and i do know and i've told a lot of women that i know whether or not that man treats you as a friend or makes a pass at you that's your decision mm -hmm. and the reason why it always is the woman's decision is because she sets the tone whether we realize it or not relationships emotionally are always set by women because we are the emotional carriers if you want to know the true leader of a relationship emotionally, it's her, not him. Every single time. Because that is our job. That is our role. He is to lead in protection. He is to lead where you go physically. But emotionally, that's her job. So if a man decides to take advantage of something, you let him do it. Mm -hmm. A man will only do to you what you allow him to. Yeah. With my male friends, there have been a few that have, in the beginning of our friendship, have tried and have been like, no, I am not for you in that way. You can either walk away from me and never see me again, or you can be my friend. Decide which one, but I'm telling you now that that will never happen. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? Nine out of ten of them have stayed. Mm -hmm. And the tenth one regrets it. Bye-bye, <laughs> 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 <Bye> Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So I, I really do, it's a, it is a conversation that has to be had of, and people need to see healthy platonic relationships. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't see it, we don't know. Yeah, and it needs to be talked about more. So, like, it's amazing that you wrote this book, and I feel like, I don't know if you're doing this, but you should have seminars for men. Um, I would love to have you a part of a couple of the events that I'm doing with, yeah with my because yeah you are you're needed your voice is needed no yeah, I'll, I'll be i'll be more than happy to i mean I've, i haven't done any I'm, i've done a couple i was i was in the states last year i went i was in um where was i i think michigan um there was a session a very interesting session we had about um toxic masculinity and i was part of the panel with amongst three other um men and also one I gave a presentation about one of my books about a taste of honey but one of the questions which one of the um female audience one of the audience members asked which it did struck me and I'll tell you what she said she said uh she was asking the men what do they do again sorry let me I remember do you remember there's a film I forgot what it's called with Denzel Washington and Viola Davis it's a powerful film I can't remember I forgot what it's called oh, fences, fences yeah. yeah so he showed a couple of clips and they wanted to you know get our intake in terms of is is this examples of toxic masculinity this that and the other and then we had a bit of the discussion and um an audience member she raised her hand and she asked why is it um that a lot of men especially african-american or black men can understand the concepts like white supremacy and racism but when it comes to sexism and toxic masculinity you're up in arms and i'll be honest all four of us were we, we were dumbfounded. We keep we were quiet. I mean, it took me a while to kind of process what she was saying, and also, admittedly, it was because a lot of times we men were the perpetrators of it. So it's difficult. The same way a lot of white people can't understand or don't want to accept the concept of like racism and white supremacy, because not to say they are racist or white supremacists, but generally, obviously, white people are the perpetrators of racism and, and um, um, white supremacy. That's the same way with with men. So that's why when as men, like although these discussions are important to had have. There will be a lot of pushback and we had a session after where it was just amongst men which i was fortunate enough to be a part of and lead one of the discussions but it took about 
half an hour for people to really say what they're truly feeling. And then some of the conversations like, and I'm, I'm, and I understand why the, why they wanted to make it male only because when we was in that space, they were being honest with each other, but then there was other people who correct and say, okay, why is it that, I mean, this is why maybe that type of attitude is problematic because a lot of men admittedly, and I'll speak about myself first and foremost, I do question, do I actually really respect women as much as I should do? Because examples where maybe when I was younger going out, if I'm if I'm interested in a woman, I'll go and approach her. Again, this is not now, this is years ago. She says she's got a boyfriend. I might still think, okay, I can still try and make a move. Only when her boyfriend were to come into this scene, that's all of a sudden when I'll step back and I'll apologise to the man. And again, that's something which happens a lot, but then it's like, okay, are you really respectful of the woman or is this because you think she's a property of another man? And I think that's something which a lot of men, unfortunately, you've got this problematic ideas in terms of how we view women and I think it does need unpacking and it needs to be challenged because it's not this idea that it's not until you have a daughter or a sister that's when you, all of a sudden you understand what is it like you know to protect women kind of thing because you do hear that a lot that people will say oh I've got a daughter as if because you've got a daughter now you can understand why women should be respected and you know treated well so up until that point you can call women and bitches hoes you can degrade them but now you've got a daughter all of a sudden, you've got this new sense of respect for women, which again, I just think that that's problematic in and of itself. You shouldn't wait until you've got a daughter, like I said, to kind of respect women. So it's something which as men, we kind of need to deal with and have these conversations amongst ourselves. But um, yeah, it, it's just something that I think definitely needs to be had and have honest conversations as well. And I think where most men will have those honest conversations is generally when they're kind of like in, in a male predominantly male environment kind of thing because when you've got a woman there what would generally happen not against with all men but some is that they will try and act up in front of the woman or they'll say the right things in order to impress the woman kind of thing and they're yeah. not being honest they'll with be themselves ego, yeah. ego yeah, exactly yeah. yeah well thank you so much for for coming on the show and like um if people are interested in in getting your book where can they find it in your other five books yeah so um, it's um on Amazon. So if you just type in Kunyaza or type in my name H A B E E B surname A K A N D E. Um, other books are also on Rabah dot com. That's R A B A A H dot com. Awesome! Thank you so much, and uh, we'll keep in touch because we're gonna be uh, thinking of different things. Because I think like the information that you have should be um given to a lot of people yeah. <laughs> I, I, it will help a lot thank I you for inviting me you're willing to be so honest and open and transparent about your mm -hmm. own journey and to admit where you were and versus where you're going a lot of men need to hear that part as well understanding that it's a process you know we're all kind of deprogramming ourselves from this westernized concepts of what we've learned that don't serve us anymore so thank you so much for being that aware Thank you for having yeah. me. And then also give your your social media um, handle so if people want to follow you and, and get more information or reach out to you, um, they can do it. Sure. So my um, Twitter and Instagram handles is the same. It's Habib Akande, H-A-B-E-E-B. -E -E um, A-K-A-N-D-E. So that's Habib Akande, H-A-B-E-E-B. A-K-A-N-D-E. Thank you so much, and um, yeah, that's all today with Heaven with Dina. Thank you, Clark, you have to give your handle if people want to get. Oh, yeah, so you can look it up under Clarkia underscore the artist, which is spelled K-L-A-I-R-K-I-A. -I -I Again, that's K-L-A-I-R-K-I-A -I -I underscore the artist. And thank you guys for being on the show. You. And make sure to check us in every Tuesday from 3 p.m. and 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you.